Now that I've cast a spell over all of you, <laughs> you begin now. Um, so it, time is very limited, as, as we know. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to give you a little glimpse into Muslim biblical hermeneutics, uh, God willing. Uh, so we're going to look at Muhammadan typologies in the Bible, the foreshadowings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now obviously this is an extremely vast topic, usually when I lecture on this topic it's a two or three hour lecture. And so I'm trying to condense it down, I'm sorry if I go a little fast, uh, but I'd like to hear more ideas or responses or fruit growing at me later during the Q&A session. Hopefully no fruit growing. Um, so Justin Martyr was a second century Christian apologist and heresiologist. Uh, he's one of the principal shapers of what's known as Logos Christology. Uh, he has many treatises that he authored. One of the most interesting one is called Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. So this is a dialogue that he kind of invented a Jewish interlocutor, and they go back and forth debating whether Christ is actually the Messiah. And for Justin Martyr, the most cogent argument that he can make uh, to bolster his idea that Christ is actually Hamashiach, the Messiah, is not looking at what's known as murajizat, not at miracles, but to look at fulfillment of prophecy. That's his strongest argument with his Jewish uh, interlocutor, is that Jesus fulfilled many messianic expectations Right? So one of the things, and this is a point of contention, a polemical contention that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years between Jews and Christians, is Isaiah chapter 7, for example, where it's stated, where it stated that uh, a child will be born, or a woman, a young woman, a virgin, what does it say? It's going to give birth to someone called Emmanuel, right? God with us. And Joseph Martyr would say, this is Jesus. And then the, the Jewish side would retort and say, no, you're not looking at the context. The context is Isaiah is talking to Ahaz, and then the son is born in Isaiah chapter 8. That's what he's talking about. Justin would retort and say, well, that's the exoteric element of the prophecy. So for Justin Martyr and for Matthew as well, Matthew the evangelist will quote this passage in his gospel. There's an exoteric element of scripture, and there's an esoteric element. There's an apparent element, and there's an unapparent element. And Imam Ghazali, who was one of the greatest Muslim the theologians and philosophers of the Middle Ages, highly influenced uh, the likes of St. Thomas Aquinas, he says, and he's quoting a hadith, he says it's either a hadith, a statement of the Prophet, or a statement of Ali, the Prophet's companion, where the Prophet said, وَلِلْقُرْآنِ ظَاهِرٌ مَبَاطٍ And for the Qur'an, there is an outward exoteric element, and there's also an esoteric element, right? So Matthew is quoting Isaiah chapter 7 and saying, yes, on the surface, it's fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 8, King Ahaz has a son, so on and so forth, but it's a Christological typology, and it's esoteric element. It's a foreshadowing of the birth of the Jewish Messiah. This is how Justin approaches scripture. This is how Origen approaches scripture. Origen of Alexandria, one of the greatest, most prolific pre-Nicene early church fathers, uh, was anathematized eventually in 553, the Common Era, because at the end of the day, he was a subordinationist, and that didn't fly, obviously, with the proto-Orthodox uh, Christians. But he wrote over a thousand books, right? And he said that Scripture has, indeed, these multiple levels of meaning. So keep that in mind when we quote some of these, these passages, that this is how Muslims read the Scripture as well, that there's an exoteric meaning. And Imam Ghazali, he... Uh, he um, condemns those who look at the apparent meaning only and forget what's on beneath the surface. They're thahiriya. He calls them literalists, right? And then he also condemns those who strictly look at the esoteric element but ignore the apparent element. He calls these people the baltiniya, the esotericists. And he says the successful combines both, right? So there, keep that in mind for now. So there is a uh, prophecy that Muslims are quoting will tend to quote uh, from the book of Deuteronomy, Sefer HaDabarim, the book of Deuteronomy, which God says to Moses, Navi akim lahem nikalav, achayhem kamocha, benatati devarai b'thif, vatabar alayhem ikkul asher atsabadu, is the Hebrew. I, I'm only fluent in English, by the way, because that's the language I cuss in. And I dream in. A little bit of other languages as well, but 
it's more of an academic understanding. It's not like I can get up and give a sermon in ancient Greek or anything like that. Um, so, it, this is a very interesting prophecy. Very, very interesting. A prophet I will raise up from their brethren. So, there's many elements of this prophecy. Now, the Quran, interestingly enough, it says, <laughs> That those who are given the previous scripture, they know the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like they know one of their own sons. When the Prophet came into Medina during the Hijrah, he made a migration, a major migration, just like Moses made a major migration, which will come into play when we talk about this prophecy, that there's a similarity between the two men. When he came into Medina, a Jewish rabbi named Abdullah ibn Salam he made a very interesting comment. He said, Araftu anna wajhahu laysa bi wajhi He said, I can tell just by looking at his face that it wasn't the face of a liar. So some of the exigents of hadith, they wonder, why did he say that? Is it because the Prophet just had an honest looking face? Or perhaps he recognized the Prophet, the physical description of the Prophet. We'll talk about that later uh, as well. Other verses in the Quran says that the Nabi al-Ummi, which is translated as unlettered Prophet, it could be translated as Gentile Prophet, the motherly Prophet, the compassionate Prophet. There's different ways of translating Nabi al-Ummi. Maktub al-Indahum fi Torah wa Injil. He is mentioned, or he is he is mentioned by name in the Torah, or described in the Torah, and in the Injil. Al-Injil means Evangelion, the Gospel. So this prophecy is interesting, because it says, Achayim, that this prophet is from their brethren. Who are the brethren of the ancient Israelites? Other Israelites. This is, this is true. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, the Israelites were commanded to pick a king from your brethren. Min Achayim, right? And they picked Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. But we also hear that the Edomites... And the Edomites don't have a good reputation, but we won't get into that. But the Edomites, who are descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob, what does God say about them in Deuteronomy 23.7? He says, Abhor not the Edomite, for he is your ach, he is your brother. Right? Well, achit, he's your brother. So the Edomites, who are Arabs, are described as brethren of the Israelites. So there's a general principle that's established here, is that the children of two brothers are brethren to one another. So the brother of... Ishmael is Isaac, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a descendant of Ishmael, Ismail alayhi salam. So their progenies are brethren to one another. And then it says, uh, this Prophet is going to be like you, is going to be like Moses. Right? Now, I try to find these correspondences between Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon him. Interestingly enough, uh, as the story goes, when the Prophet, peace be upon him, was 40 years old, he used to go to this cave in this mountain called Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light, for what's known as uh, Tahannuth or Tehinnuth in Hebrew, which is some sort of devotional practice he would do in the cave. And then he was visited by an angel. This is a story that's given in Sira literature, in Hadith literature. The angel came to him and said, Iqra, and the Prophet responded, Ma'ani biqari. Read, I cannot read. And this goes back and forth, which is very interesting also, because we read in Isaiah 29.12, the book, is one who, the book is given to one who knoweth no letters. The book is given to one who is Ummi, Nabi al-Ummi, who is unlettered. And it shall be said to him in Hebrew, Qara. And Qara is the exact cognate of the Arabic, Iqra. It is exactly the same word. And he shall answer, Lo yada'ati sayfar. I don't know the book. I am unlettered. So this is a perfect prophecy of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Of course you have people who would say, operating under a hermeneutic of suspicion, they say, oh, the Prophet knew it and he engineered it so, right? And this goes back to, like, Justin and his Jewish interlocutor debating, right? So why do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? The Christian would say, look, in the book of Zechariah, it says the king of Zion sits on a donkey. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus came into Jerusalem sitting on a donkey. And then the Jewish interlocutor would say, well, Jesus knew that. And he engineered it, he self-fulfilled it, right? A hermeneutic of suspicion, right? So that's one way of looking at the scripture. Anyway... After this happens, the Prophet goes to his wife Khadija, and he tells her what had happened. And she's not a scholar, so she said, let's go to a scholar, which is a great lesson, that if you don't know, like the Qur'an says, فس, If you don't know, go to the people of knowledge. So they go to who? A Christian scribe named Waraqa bin Nawfal. And what does Waraqa say? لَقَدْ جَاءَكَ النَّمُوسُ الْأَكْبَرُ كَمَا جَاءَ إِلَىٰ مُوسَىٰ عَلَيْهِ السلام. There has come unto you the great nomos. Namus is the Greek word for the Torah. It's called Pentateuch or Hanamas, the law of God. 
Right? There has come unto you the law of God. Kama, just like it came. And this kama particle is interesting because that's exactly what's used in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Kama kamocha, like you. This prophet will be like you. The great law has come unto you just as it came to Moses. This is what Waraka ibn Nofa tells the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The prophet Muhammad, he said to his cousin Ali, Ama tarda an takuna minni bi manziliti harun min Musa ghayra la nabiya ba'di aw kama qala he said, are you not pleased that you are to me as Aaron was to Moses? So he has that correspondence. The biggest, the most important correspondence, I think, between Moses and Muhammad, peace be upon both of them, is that both were given sharia, halaqa, a system of law, divine law. God revealed a complete system of law, sacred law, in its outward and inward aspects. And the Quran says in many places that there is a similarity between the two men. We gave Moses the book, the law. So don't be in doubt about it reaching you. Right? You're going to also receive this law, this great law of God, the nomos, the, uh, the namus, al-akbar. So there's a similarity there. Another verse in the Quran says, Inna arsalna ilayka rasulan shahidan alaykum kama arsalna ila fir'awna rasula. Verily we have sent a messenger to be a witness over you, just as we had sent a messenger unto the Pharaoh. Kama, again, this particle of comparison is used. So the Hebrew says, Nabi Akim lahim mikarev, achehim kamocha. From their brethren, this prophet will be like you. Vinatati tevarai befif. I will put my words into his mouth. I will put my words into his mouth. Vidabar alayhim, ikkum asharat sabanu. And he will speak unto them everything that I command him. He does not speak except by the command of God. Right? The Quran says the Prophet does not speak from his hawa. He does not speak from his own caprice, his own desire. It is no less an inspiration sent down to him. And some Muslims will say that this prophecy of 1818 finds further description in the descriptions of the Johannine Gospels Parakletos, the Paraclete of the Gospel of John, which many Christian exegetes uh, will say that, uh, for example, Raymond Brown uh, in the Anchor Bible will say, later on it was ascribed to the Holy Spirit, but it could have been an, a different type of salvific figure that was later confused with the Holy Spirit, but that's a different topic uh, altogether. Now this prophet of 1818 Deuteronomy, it's carried into the New Testament. So we are told from the Gospel of John, which was written around 90 of the Common Era, 100, 110 of the Common Era. That's the dominant opinion of biblical scholars, New Testament scholars. That the Jews in the, at, during that time were uh, expecting the coming of three great luminaries. Three great luminaries. Right? So it says here, and this is the passage I have on the sheet there, it's, it's in the Koine Greek. So basically it says, and this is a witness of John, when Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to John in order to ask him, Sutis A, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, and he, could, and he confessed, Uk Amy, Ego Ha Christos, I am not the Messiah. So this is the first person that the children of Israel were waiting for at the time of the Gospel of John, according to the Gospel of John. They were waiting for the Christ. And then they say, Ti On, Alidas A Su, are you Elijah? According to the book of 2 Kings, Elijah was carried up into a chariot of a fire into the heavens, and there was a dominant belief amongst a Jewish elements in the first century, second century, that he's going to precede the coming of the Messiah. And he says, what? He says, uh, no, who can I am not. And then they say, ha, prophetes esu. Are you the prophet? Right? So they're not asking him, are you a prophet? Right? It's not, a, it's not indefinite. Ha is a definite article in Koine Greek. Are you the prophet? Right? And he says, ooh, which means no. Right? So these are the three people that they were waiting for, these great luminaries that were supposed to come. Elias, or Elijah, Elias, Elias, Eliyahu, and HaMashiach, the Messiah, the Christ, and who? And Nabi, HaProphetes, the prophet. Nabi Akim Lahem Mikarev, the prophet that's like Moses. So it's according to Stephen L. Harris, these two people are different. The Christ and the prophet are two different, separate and distinct people. We cannot conflate the two. And the evidence of this is found also in the Gospel of John. 
when we read John chapter 7, it's also something I've produced here, it's the verse under that. Jesus is in Galilee, he's performing all of these miracles, right? And people don't really know what to make of him. So it says here that some of the people said, Hutas estin aleitos ha prophetes. This truly is the prophet. This is the prophet, right? Referring to what? Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. This is the prophet like unto Moses. And then it says, others said, others said, Hutas estin ha Christos. This is the Christ. And there was a schisma between them. There was a difference of opinion. Is this the Christ or is this the prophet? See, they're two separate and distinct people. They're not one and the same. Right? So Muslims will say that this is indeed a prophecy of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him. Now something else I wanted to talk about, uh, another passage which... Uh, uh, I know I'm going very fast here. Um, this is an interesting passage. This is from the Song of Solomon. So the Song of Solomon is called Shira Hashirim in Hebrew, which is a way of making the superlative in the Hebrew. You repeat the word and you make it plural. Like the best king is who? The king of kings. The best book is the book of books. The best shir, the best poem, or the best song is the Shir Hashirim, the Song of Songs. So traditionally this was believed to have been authored by Solomon some 3,000 years ago. Now what's interesting is, on the surface, right, the exoteric element suggests that this is simply a dialogue between a lover and a beloved, and we should make nothing more of that. That's what it is. But Jewish exegetes and Christian exegetes, they have different ways of reading the scripture. So many Jewish exegetes will say that this is actually, at the esoteric level, uh, depicting God's relationship with Israel, the lover and the beloved. Christian exegetes will say this is depicting at its esoteric level, its unapparent level, the relationship between Christ and the church. Roger Aylesworth, who's the president of the Illinois Baptist Association, he actually wrote a book called He is Altogether Lovely, Finding Christ in the Song of Solomon. That's how he reads the scripture. There's an exoteric element, there's an esoteric element. So let's look at this description. It's really interesting. I'm going to be quoting from chapter 5, starting at verse 10 from the Shira Hashirim. It says here, my beloved is white and red, chief amongst 10,000. So Muslims immediately recognize, right? Right when we read that word, Dodi, we say, oh, this is a title of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Because one of the most exalted titles of the Prophet Muhammad, according to Islamic tradition, is, according to, according to Islamic prophetology, is Habibullah, the beloved of God. He has the station of Mahabba. The station of love, which is the highest station. Now, Dr. Nafi, he quoted the verse, We don't make distinctions between prophets. Right. We don't do that. This is first person, common, singular, uh, plural. We don't make distinctions, but we believe as Muslims that God has them at different darajat. That some prophets are above others. They have a higher station than others. This is what the Qur'an says. And we believe that the Prophet Muhammad is khayrin khalikillah. He is the best of creation. He is creation. He's a human being. He's a human being, but he's the best human being. Right? So our position regarding the Prophet is analogous to Arius' position regarding Christ, represented at the Synod of Nicaea 325 of the Common Era, when Arius said that Christ is kitisma teleun. He's the best of creation, but he's not homoousios. He doesn't share an essence with God. Because he considered that to be idolatry, right? So Muslims believe that. But he's the best human being. Like the poet said, Muhammadun Basharun, wa laysa kal bashari, wa huwa yaqudatun wa nasu kal hajari. He said, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a human being, but he's not like other human beings. He's a diamond or a ruby, and everyone else is a stone. A, a diamond is still a stone. Essentially, is the same as any other stone. It's a stone, right? But it's the greatest stone. Possibly. I don't know. It's, uh, what's better than a diamond? Anyway, so it says, My beloved is white and red. And if you look at descriptions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, there's a whole genre of literature called Shama'il literature. Shama'il literature. The, this is literature that's dedicated to describing the physical attributes of the Prophet. His physicality as well as his comportment. His khalq and his khuluq, his outward and inward, his batin and vahir uh, uh, aspects. 
So interestingly, Imam Ali, he describes the Prophet in the Shama'il of Abu Isa Tirmidhi. This is probably the most uh, famous book of Shama'il written uh, by a scholar. He says, لَوْنَهُ أَزْهَرْ أَبْيَدُ مُشْرَبُ His complexion was a white with redness. A white with redness. That was his complexion. Dodid sakhfa adum. My beloved is white and red. Degul mervava, chief amongst ten thousand. So many Muslim scholars would, would say that this is probably a reference to the conquest of Mecca when the Prophet, peace be upon him, came into the city of Mecca with ten thousand companions and took control of the city without any uh, one getting killed. There was no vengeance. He parted the city, declared a general amnesty. He climbed, he climbed a little hill called Abu Qubais. And he said, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم يغفر الله لكم God has, uh, there is no blemish upon you today. God has forgiven you. And sometimes we forget this, ap this aspect of the Prophet. The Prophet's uh, magnanimous character, his gentleness. The Prophet وسلم, peace be upon him, uh, his wife said, and nobody knows better, no one, no one knows the man better than the wife. Trust me, no one knows the man better than the wife. What did she say, Aisha? She said, لَمْ يَضْرِبْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم شَيْئًا بِيَدْهِ قَدْ The Prophet never struck anything. Not a woman, غَلَام, إِمْرَأَةً, وَلَدَ a, a boy, a woman, a servant, never struck anyone with his hand. لَمْ يَضْرِبْ قَدْ He never struck anyone with his hand. This is what his wife said, who grew up in his household. This is what Ali also said, who grew up in his household. You know, the Prophet at the Battle of Uhud, there was a battle called Ghazwat Uhud. And the Prophet was wounded in his blessed face and there was blood streaming down his face. And he was seen trying to catch the blood with his hands. Right? And his companion said, what are you doing? And he said, help me uh, catch the blood. And he was absorbing the blood with his sleeves and trying to catch it. He said, why do you want to do that? He said, if one drop of this blood should strike the earth, then immediately Immediately, our enemies, the people we're fighting right now, will be struck, annihilated, obliterated by angels. Immediately. So his companion said, that's good. Isn't that good? Let it flow. Right? So a short time later, he was seen with his hands up in the air, supplicating. And the companion said, ah, al-an, now it's over. Game over for our enemies. So they heard him, and he said, Allahumma hadi qawmi. Oh God, guide my people, for they don't know. You know, we're told that when Jesus is on the cross, of course, Christians don't believe, uh, I'm sorry, Muslims don't believe that Jesus was crucified. It's a major difference. But according to Luke, and by the way, the vast majority of biblical scholars, New Testament textual critics, do not believe Jesus actually said this. So they put it in brackets, and it's in brackets in critical editions of the New Testament. Anyway, it's there in brackets. Jesus is on the cross, and he says, Pater afes autois. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We hear that all the time. Every Jesus movie I've ever seen. But he didn't really say that, according to the vast majority of Christian exegetes. That does that mean that Jesus is not a merciful person? Of course he is. Of course he's a merciful person. But we never hear anything like that ascribed to the Prophet Muhammad. And these are sound traditions. That the Prophet prayed for his enemies with blood streaming down his face. When he's in a position of power, when he's in a position to exact vengeance, he forgives them. And this is because of the great prophetic and Quranic imperative. The Quran says, Repel evil with beauty. Repel evil with beauty. Push back evil with beauty. This is what the Quran says. He never returned an evil for an evil. This is what his wife says. No one knows the man better than his wife. Don't ask my wife. <laughs> So then it says, I can't read this whole thing because it's too long, I'm running out of time here. It says, That his head is like gold, his locks are wavy and black as a raven. So going back to the Shama'i literature of Imam Ali, he describes the Prophet's hair. He says, The Prophet's hair was not curly nor straight, but something between that. It was wavy and extremely black. Now what's very interesting, the word orev here in the Hebrew is usually trans is always translated into English, every translation I've seen. It's translated as raven, black as a raven. There was a Bible translation done by uh, Fenton around 1920 called the Holy Bible in Modern English. Because this word orev, it appears in another passage in the plural, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4, 
where God, Adonai Elohim, he commands Eliyahu, Elijah, to go uh, and into the wilderness. And he says that the Haorvim, Haorvim, the plural of Orev, are going to feed you there. So Fenton, he translated that as Arabs. The Arabs are going to feed you there. Why did he translate that as Arabs? Because this word is also the word for Arab. Araba, Ayin, Reish, Beit, Aram, Orvim. The Arabs are going to feed you there. So it's very, very interesting that at possibly one of the esoteric levels of meaning of the Shira Hashirim, his hair is black and wavy, Kaorev, as an Arab. And then it uh, continues. I don't have time to go through the entire thing. How much time do I have left? Two more hours, go ahead. Two more hours, sorry. Just, I don't want to go over the time because I want to be fair to everyone. Um, I think we're okay. Okay. So verse 15, the second half of verse 15 that I want to talk about. It says, Marehu kalvanon, bachur karazim. His countenance is like Lebanon. Bachur is a passive participle. Bachur means chosen like the cedars. He's chosen. Right? So one of the titles again of the Prophet Muhammad is Al-Mustafa, Al-Mukhtar, Al-Mujtaba. These are titles. The chosen one, the elect one, the one separated out, the chosen one, things like that. And it's also very interesting because the chosen one of God is also described in the book of Isaiah, chapter 42, the chosen one of God, right? Now, when Muslims read the Gospel of Matthew, they're very, it's very interesting for me to read Matthew because Matthew, according to Matthew, all of these uh, expectations, prophetological, messianic expectations, all of them are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And sometimes he'll quote something and he won't justify his reason why. Why is this referring to Jesus? So Matthew in chapter 12 or 13, I think it's chapter 13, he'll quote from Isaiah 42 and say, this is what Eli, uh, uh, Isaiah said, that, uh, behold my chosen one whom my soul delights. But he'll misquote the passage, actually. He adds something, he's my beloved but the Septuagint doesn't actually say my beloved, but he added that, right? And at times he'll quote something from the Nabim, the prophets, that, are, that is simply not found anywhere in the Nabim. For example, Matthew chapter 2, he shall be called a Nazarene. That's nowhere to be found in any book, inside or outside the Hebrew scriptures, in the Old Testament or in the Pseudepigrapha or the Apocrypha, wherever you look. So it's very interesting. So Muslims will say, possibly, as Yoda once said, a, a prophecy misapplied, perhaps. He uses very bad syntax, by the way. Yoda, right, is a Hebrew name. Anyway. <clears throat> so, anyway, Isaiah 42 is very interesting. I'll go back to Song of Songs in a minute. But it says, and it's a description of the Evet Adonai, the slave of God. Hen abdi et machbo, nafshi. Behold my servant whom I uphold my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. And it goes on to describe him. He will not raise his voice in the marketplace. And this is exactly how Aisha, again, who knows the man better than the wife, describes the Prophet. She says, The Prophet did not raise his voice in the marketplace. He was soft-spoken. He never raised his voice, let alone raise his hand. So then it continues. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to wrap it up here, God willing. My incoherent ramblings will end soon, I promise. And then it says, in verse 16, this is a, an interesting verse. It says, mamthaqim. His mouth is sweet. Vikullo mahammadim. He is altogether lovely. Zehdudi. This is my beloved. Zehrei. This is my friend. Banyoth Yerushalayim. O daughters of Jerusalem. So, one time, one more time. Chikko manthaqim bikullo machamadim machamadim So Muhammad is the name of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So Muslims will say, and this is poetry, so poetry is very seldom direct. It's indirect, it's elliptical. This is the nature of poetry, right? So there's an echo, there's an actual echo of the name of this beloved given in the verse. It's spelled exactly as the Arabic. Mim chet mam dalit, mim ha mim dal. Mim ha mim dal. Right? So this is very, very interesting. Now, Muslims will also say that other places in the Hebrew Bible, uh, they also contain sort of an elliptical message. Muslims don't believe that Jesus was crucified. Right? And it used to be that, you know, 
when a Muslim or Christian would engage in dialogue, people don't like the word debate, so I'm going to avoid it. Polemical discourse, right? lively talk. Right? Uh, the Christian would say to the Muslim, why don't you believe Jesus was crucified? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John multiply attested, what's wrong with you? And the Muslim would say what? Well, you know, it's the Quran. It says, wa qataluhu, wa ma They didn't kill him, they didn't crucify him. Right? So I, that's why I don't believe in it. Right? And that was before 1945 when Nag Hammadi was discovered. And now we have evidence that there were Christian denominations that predate the formation of the New Testament canon that certainly did not believe that Jesus was crucified. But at the time, Muslims don't know this. Muslims also don't know Hebrew. So they don't know what the book of Psalms says, chapter 20, verse 6. It says what? So David writes in the Psalms, I know, I know, I have known that God saves his Messiah. He shall, he shall hear him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. Yeshua. It's on the form of a passive participle, a shortened form of Yehoshua. Yeshua means saved by God. That's what his name means. Oftentimes, in the names of prophets, you have uh, a secret. The name Muhammad means the most praised one, which is very interesting because every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year of every decade of every century, every nanosecond, 24 hours a day until the day of judgment, somebody is sending blessings of peace upon the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's going on right now. Because there's Muslims always praying, and in our prayer, we do what? We send salawat on the Prophet Muhammad, and on the progeny of Muhammad, and on the progeny of who else? Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophet Abraham, and his progeny. This is going on 24-7, around the clock until the Day of Judgment. His name is Muhammad, right? So, I always tell Muslims, you know, nobody, nobody on earth can ever uh, compromise that, can ever lessen the rank of the Prophet by writing something or making some stupid movie in a garage. It's like the poet said, it's like dogs barking at the moon. Is the moon affected as it traverses the majestic sky by dogs on earth barking at it? It doesn't even hear it. It's not affected by it. <laughs> barking at the moon. And for us on earth, it's just white noise. It's just annoying. And the Quran says that, <laughs> You're going to hear much from other people that's going to really bother you. So what's our response? This is the response the Quran gives. But if you show patience and self-constraint, taqwa, taqwa means consciousness of God, and sabr, and, and patience, that is the determining factor in all affairs. This is by order of the Quran. The Prophet, peace be upon him, they used to make fun of him during his time. They used to physically abuse him. They used to revile him in their poetry. This, the companions were, and these are desert Arabs, right? So they have a hot temperament. So they said, we have to take vengeance. And he said, you know, because you know, they, they made up a name for the Prophet. They used the opposite of his name. Instead of Muhammad, they called him Mudhammam, right? The least praiseworthy. And they told this to the Prophet. They said, this is what they're saying about you. And the Prophet said, man Mudhammam. Who is Muhammad? I am Muhammad. And he kind of laughed it off. And they started laughing with him. Who cares what people are saying? The Quran says, Inna Allaha wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala nabi. The Quran says, God himself is sending blessings of peace on the Prophet Muhammad. God himself. God. Forget about what we're doing 24-7. Who is God? Rabbus samawati wa al The sustainer of the heavens and the earth. Allah. Allah himself sends blessings of peace upon the Prophet. Who is Allah, the God of Abraham? Jesus says, according to the Peshitta translation of the New Testament, in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are those who make peace. They shall be called the children of Allah. This is what it says in the Syriac. Children in the sense, not in the literal sense. Muslims don't get it. Not in the literal sense. Jesus, he teaches them the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. What does that mean? It means he's our, here, he's our Lord, he's our sustainer, he's our cherisher, right? So the Quran says that God himself is sending blessings of peace upon the Prophet Muhammad. 
If this is true, and if we really believe that as Muslims, what can some fool do by making some video or drawing a cartoon? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Right? Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, this is a bit controversial, but sometimes some controversial questions can shed some light. How does Islam, how does Islamic faith define infidels? Are other people of the book, Jews, Christians, considered infidels? So, uh, 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 should, should I <laughs> Yeah, infidel is a Latin word created by the Roman Catholic Church. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> although that is true. Um, um, so the word in Arabic is kafir, and kafir literally means a farmer. What does that have to do with farming? What does infidelity have to do with farming? You see, the farmer, he takes a seed and he covers it over. Right? He hides it. So the Quran describes a true kafir, a true infidel or a non-believer. It says, do not clothe the truth with falsehood, nor distort the truth while you have knowledge of the truth. Right? While you have knowledge of the truth. So someone who's a kafir, we have to be very careful as Muslims when we throw terminology around. Right? We use the word haram, this is forbidden, this person's a kafir, so on and so forth. You see, there's a difference between someone who's a kafir as a legal distinction or a state distinction in a Muslim country. You're either Muslim or you're not. Right? Yeah, that's in the legal sense. But the faith sense, that's ultimately only known by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's known by God. So many of our theologians, the dominant opinion amongst our theologians is not so much black and white. Right? I use Imam Ghazali again as my, kind of my model, as my kind of core theologian, who says that in order for infidelity to be established, a person must have aqal, must be badat, salamatul hawas, wabadabatu adawatu sahiha. Four criteria. He says the person must be an adult. They must have sound intellect. They must have sound senses, you know, sight and hearing. And the prophetic summons reach that person in a good form. And then they reject it. A prophetic summons, either from Jesus or Moses or Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. Right? So, for example, what if you were born in Nottingham in the 4th century? And all you know about is, well, I guess it would be after that. Because Christianity didn't come until a little bit later. But anyway, let's say 11th century. And all you know about Muslims is they're infidels who have taken the Holy Land and they're slaughtering babies in the streets of Jerusalem. And that's all you know about Muslims. Then many Muslim theologians will say, well, the prophetic summons, the true essence of the prophetic message, did not reach that person in a good form. So you cannot call people kafir, right? We have to be very, very careful. The Muslim does not have a personal guarantee of paradise. I've been condemned to hell many times by people of different religions, by the way. Many, I say, usually, you're going to hell. You know that about me? I know for certain. You're going to burn in hell. Really? Wow, that's amazing. Judge not lest ye be judged. Right? It's John. So, we don't have a personal guarantee. The Quran, the Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Man shahida an la ilaha illallah, dakhila, dakhila jannah, wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah, dakhila jannah. Whoever witnesses to that declaration of faith will enter paradise. It doesn't say, Ali yun fi San Ramon dakhala Jannah. They say Ali from San Ramon is going to go to Jannah. I don't have a personal guarantee. Because when we have personal guarantees, then what happens? We start to act irresponsibly. I have two girls. I tell one of my girls, uh, if you're good, we're going to go to Disneyland in December. Oh, yes. I'm going to be good. So she tries, she strives. But if I tell the other one, I say, we're going to go to Disneyland and do, do whatever you want. You have that guarantee. Go do whatever you want. Then probably she'll be a little lax on her. So we don't have a personal guarantee. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, be between hope and faith. Wear the two sandals of hope and faith. Don't be so hopeful in God that you start to delude yourself and become judgmental. And don't be so, uh, um, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, hope and faith. Hope and, what's the other word? Fear. fear. Hope and fear. And don't be so fearful of God that you start going into despair. The Quran says in an imperative, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. You are not allowed to despair of the mercy of God. It is, is haram, it is as forbidden as eating pork and drinking alcohol and committing adultery. To be in despair, oh, how can God forgive me? I'm a terrible person. 
God forgives. God forgives if you make teshuva, you make toba. There's a beautiful hadith from the Prophet, peace be upon him. After one of the military expeditions, there was, you know, there was a battle, and this woman was running around frantic. She had lost her infant son, little toddler, could barely crawl around, right? And, uh, and this was in front of the, some of the companions. And then the prophets, and then the woman, she saw her son, she picked him up and started to hug him and breastfeed him. And the prophet said, do you see that woman? And they said, yes. And the prophet said, can you imagine that she would take her child and throw him in a fire? Can you imagine her doing that? And they said, la wallahi, by God, no. And the prophet said, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. God is more merciful to his servants than this woman is to her son. God is more merciful. Rahma, right? Dr. Ejaz, he said, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. These are God's attributes in the Quran. He is Rahman and Rahim, the most merciful. The root word here is Rechem, which is a Hebrew word also, which means the womb of a mother, where the fetus is enclosed. There's a beautiful analogy here. God is more merciful to his servants than the purest type of love on earth, which is the love of a mother for her son. I think I've exhausted the times, but again, it's not black and white. It's not Kafir Muslim. We're not allowed to judge, right? If we carefully throw these terms around, God is the ultimate judge.